if you want to buy land, this video is going to be really helpful. I'm going to cover how to buy land, whether you're using a loan, whether you have cash, or whether you're trying to do owner financing like we did. I'm going to share exactly how to do that. My name is Brandon, and me and my family bought this piece of land. On, I'm on five acres in northern Idaho. We're currently building a barn dough, which is right there. And uh, I have a tremendous amount of real estate experience. I've been a realtor, a broker, I've done loans, I've done real estate funds and real estate investment. So I've done pretty much everything in real estate. And if you're thinking about buying some land, this is gonna be really helpful. I'm gonna break down every step that you need to know so that you can buy land and get a great deal on it. I think there's really four steps to buying a piece of land. First, you need to find it. Then you need to find the seller. Then you need to negotiate the deal. And then you need to close the deal. So we're gonna go through all of those things. So I think the first step in buying real estate is knowing where you wanna live, obviously. Makes sense. For our family, we sold everything. We moved into our RV and we traveled all across the state to try to find a place that we really loved. I can't recommend this enough because it really gave us the ability to get a feel for all of the different areas, what the community was like, and how it was going to be to live in these specific spots. So having the RV was really, really good. On top of that too, we could live in the RV while we built. So that was awesome. So can't recommend that enough. So once you find the area that you want to live in, you need to find some land that's going to be suitable. You need to know how big you need it to be. You need to know kind of everything possible that you're looking for in terms of amenities, uh, what the land is going to be like, what you're going to do with it all of that good stuff. And I'm not going to cover that super in depth right now because this is more about acquiring, but you need to know what you want to have. Once you get that, there's really just two options when it comes to finding land. First off, you need to know uh, basically every property that's on the market. That's super straightforward. You can get lists of properties that are on the MLS and then go after those. When it comes to MLS properties, it's less likely that you're going to be able to do creative terms. You have to pay the real estate agent involved in the transaction and they're going to probably try to push you towards a more conventional outcome. That makes sense because that's how realtors and brokers are trained. Everything revolves around loans and getting paid off as quickly as possible because that's how it's profitable for them. Totally understand that mindset because I was a realtor and a broker and especially working with people that you know, there's just a huge variance of training when it comes to agents and experience. And so they might not know that you can do seller financing. They might not know that you can do different kinds of terms. So it just is really difficult to know for sure. I think a lot of times, if you can find deals or properties that are off market, you're going to have more opportunities when it comes to structuring the terms of the deal. So let's talk about a few ways to find property. So when it comes to finding deals that are off market, and by off market, I mean they're not listed in the MLS with the realtor, I think a good place to find these deals is honestly Craigslist is really good. It seems like in rural communities, Craigslist is still really, really used. Facebook Marketplace is another great place to find deals. Beyond that, you can search for the county's tax assessor website, and you can find the tax records for properties because those are public knowledge. Now, every single county is going to have a little bit different of a system, but if you're not able to find details that you're looking for, uh, then you're going to want to go to a title company. I would suggest going to a title company rather than a realtor, because when you enter into a transaction, even if it's private, you're probably going to want to use a title company. And so you'll be able to compensate them for the help. And so they'll be more willing to help because you're looking for property and they have the ability to get compensated. If you approach a realtor and you say, Hey, I'm trying to buy a deal and I'm trying to go off market with it. They're not going to be super motivated to help you just because they can't get paid. Nobody should be working for free for sure. So going to a title company is usually better because you're going to be able to get better detailed information. A realtor would have to go to a title company anyways to get you ownership information on a property. A lot of times with county websites, there's going to be a map. And so you can actually click on tax parcels to find the owner information. Like with our property, there was no address attached to it. So we couldn't put in an address. We would have had to gone to the tax website, gone to the map, and then clicked on the map to find the owner. We were trying to find out who owns the lot next door because we've never seen them. Um, and so we actually did that, went to the tax map, clicked on it, and were able to find the information for the person next door. So that is, is how you're going to find those deals. Once you find a piece of land that's suitable, I think the, the next step is to reach out and engage. Now this is really, really important because there's a lot of ways to mess up a deal. 
And the first thing that you want to do is you don't want to appear that you're too eager, that you're too desperate. You just want to start a conversation. I think the easiest opener when it comes to starting a conversation is, you know, hey, my name is so-and-so. I was interested in your piece of land. Potentially, would you be open at all to selling? That's just as simple as you need to make it. Would you be open to selling? Are you interested or open to selling? Those are the magic words. Don't get more pushy. Don't appear more desperate. Just really try to get a foot in the door at this point. So any kind of super vague, non-threatening, non-committal language is the way to go about it. You know, just be super friendly and super open. Usually it's kind of difficult to find people. Um, you can find them online. I would always tell people how you found them too, because a lot of times it's kind of creepy that you're saying like, hey, I know that you own this piece of land. That's just a you know wide open piece of land. And I know all of this personal information about you. Can I talk to you about maybe buying it, right? People put up a defense right away. So explain, hey, I saw, I am looking for property. Give them a story and, and really fill in all of these gaps. So something like, you know, I'm looking for property. So I went on to the tax assessor's website and I got your information from the, the county. And I was just interested in, in seeing if you're maybe open to the possibility of selling, right? Super non-committal, super non-threatening. It gets the conversation started. So from there, if you do get a response, and it's probably going to take a few times for you to get a response, just because a lot of times people, the mindset of people that own land is that I own this land. It's not really costing me much. I've got property taxes on it. Maybe I use it for livestock or, you know, whatever. But the, the mindset is very, very important to understand of landowners. You have to know. So land is a really illiquid asset, right? Where you buy it, you don't typically expect to flip it right away. For somebody that's owned it for a long time, you have to think, what is their mindset? The first rule of real estate is that you want to make your money when you buy it. So you don't want to overpay for it. You want to make sure that you get great terms on it. So whenever I approach real estate, I want to make sure that it's a win-win for everybody. I don't want to take advantage of people. I want to make sure that everybody is trying to get what they want. Obviously, I want to make sure that I'm getting property at a great price and I want to get great terms on it, but I also want to meet the goals of the person selling. And I think that's really what helps you to be more successful. We have to think about what is in it for them. What do they want so that we can frame the offer that we're going to make in terms of what they actually want. I think a lot of people get wrapped up in like, this is what I want. I'm going to get the best deal possible. Like that's fine. It's okay to think about what you want, obviously. But if you're going to be successful, especially with deals that are not on the market, you have to think about what's in it for them. Because if you're not able to motivate them to take action, there's no reason for them to sell. They have a piece of land that is valuable. It's an asset, right? It's typically not super liquid. They don't think they're going to get a huge payoff necessarily. And so, it's just been storing value for them. And that's a lot of times how they think about it. It's land is a store of value, a hedge against inflation, just something good to have, right? They're not making more of it. So eventually it'll probably go up. That's what most people think, right? So we have to think about what is it that they want? What are the benefits that we can convey to them? And really what's their motivation? If we can figure out exactly what they want and how to provide the most benefit to them, we're going to be able to probably put a deal together and we'll probably be able to format in a way that is win-win. So when starting off the conversation, just really open it up. Would, would you be open to the possibility of selling? And then they'll pro probably say, sure. What you wanna do then is get them talking. Just get them to explain their current situation. Try to get them to explain their current financial situation. Get them to try to explain their current financial goals. And the best way to do that is to talk to them with open-ended questions. Things like, well, that's really cool. Uh, when did you get the property? How did you come? by owning it. Uh, how long have you owned it for? Did you have any plans with that property? What do you currently use it for? Get them talking and get them open. Uh, generally, those kinds of open-ended questions are great. If you ask them yes or no questions, you're gonna get yes and no answers. So that first question is, would you be open to the possibility of selling? That's a yes or no question. That opens the door for the next question. If they say no, say great, I totally understand. If that changes at any time, would you please reach out to me? I'm looking. And then they'll say yes or no. Another good thing that you can say is, well, do you know anybody who might be interested in selling some land similar to that? Right? Those kinds of questions that are going to open the door for more uh, potential opportunities for you. Don't ever miss an opportunity to try to get additional referrals and 
um, information that might be beneficial. A lot of times in small towns especially, everybody knows everybody's business. And so if you can find people who are, you know, know everybody who've been around for a long time, chances are they're probably gonna know somebody who's been thinking about selling. In a specific example here that you can take from what I did with my piece of land. So we found this listing on Craigslist and it had been listed for about a month. So I reached out to the guy and I said, hey, are you still open to selling? And he said, yes. Typically at the beginning of these conversations, they're super yes or no, they're very, very guarded. And so I said, well, can you tell me about it? Um, what's the property like? And started just diving into the property, what he had done, what he had initially planned on doing, what he was doing now, why he was selling, and really started to develop a relationship with them and said, you know, I'm really interested in it. Tell you what, I'll go take a look at it today and then I'll call you back and we'll talk more about it. So in opening this conversation, I found out why he was selling, what he thought the property was worth, why he thought the property was worth much lower than he actually had bought it for eight years before, um, his motivation in terms of why he needed the money, how much money he needed, and just a ton of information. If you can get people to start talking, they'll really start to give you a story. Um, and I think that's really important why you give people a backstory, a why you're looking for land, what you're planning on doing with it. And especially if you're thinking about building a house for your family or you're thinking about building a homestead, people are super open to that. Um, especially older people, they think it's really cool if you're trying to build a house for your family or you know that you have plans. They generally think, hey, this is pretty cool. I would love to help out with that. People are generally helpful, generally very nice. And so if you give people a little bit of more information about your story, who you are, you know, your family, what your goals are, things like that, it's gonna be very helpful. So once you have as much information as possible about their motivation, why they'd be open to selling, what their plans were with it, what they're going to do with it, you know, on and on and on, as much information as possible, then you have to start asking, I think, important questions. So if somebody said, well, you know, I actually am going through a divorce right now and I need a bunch of cash, that's gonna tell you that these people probably aren't open to doing long-term financing or you know, depending on your situation, what you can do. But at the same time, if somebody's very motivated to sell, you're probably gonna be able to pick it up at a better price. So it just really depends on what their goals are and what your goals are. If you can't make it a win-win, I don't suggest doing it because you don't wanna take advantage of people and you don't wanna be taken advantage of. So make sure that it aligns with the goals that you have. But the very next question, after you get as much information as possible is, you're gonna to wanna to say, well, what price would you be open to selling at? And framing it in terms of what price would you be open to selling at is gonna make it, again, non-committal. It's gonna give you a starting place, and then you're gonna be able to understand exactly kind of where you're going in on this deal. So when you can frame as many conversations as possible in terms of what would you be open to, what are you interested in? That's a very, very non-committal language and it gives you a starting place. Whenever I try to open a conversation when I'm negotiating for land or anything, it's always, what would you be open to? What would you be interested in? That kind of language helps you to get a foot in the door and gives you a starting place. It's always better to have them tell the price from the beginning so that you can then have a place to work from. In the case of our land, he set a price that was very, very low. I was really excited about it. And so if I would have said, hey, I'll be, you know, give you a hundred grand for that land, we would have been missing out on a huge opportunity. It turns out he only wanted 35,000 for it, which is great because it was a really good deal. And so we said, okay, I'd be, I'd be interested at that price. But depending on what somebody says, if they say, oh, I'd want a million dollars for that piece of land then you'd say, okay, well, I'm gonna go take a look at it and do a little bit more research. But it gives you the power position to say, okay, that sounds like a good price, I'd be interested in that, or I'm gonna take a look at it and do a little bit more research. If you have a piece of land that you know you like, um, but it doesn't have power near it, you know, you can, doesn't have water, doesn't have good dirt for septic, like all of these different things that it might not have, you're gonna wanna know that before you agree to a price. When it comes to negotiation, things that you can use for reducing a price point is number one, you can show comps and comparable sales. And that's generally how land is valued. What is it worth um, versus other property? And then you can also talk about things that are right next door. For example, with our property, we have a lumber mill that's not too far away. 
It doesn't bother us at all, but it might bother other people. And so that's a little bit of a negative um, in, in most eyes. And so we said, hey, if there's lumber mill right next to it. Can you tell me about that? And so then you highlight these problems that make the, the property seem less valuable to a broader market. You have to think about the asset in terms of what other people would be willing to pay for it too. So whenever you can, try to devalue it in terms of a broader market that helps you to negotiate price. So highlighting the problems, the issues, the difficulties, all of these things is very, very helpful. So price is only the first half though. Once you have the price, the next question is, okay, great. That sounds good. That price works for me. Now, what would you be open to in terms of seller financing? So once we agree on the price, and this is what I did with the, the gentleman here, I said, well, would you be open to seller financing? I'm going to be building a house here, so I would like to conserve as much cash as possible. What would you be open to doing? Now with our land, we were able to get interest-free payments for a year. He needed a specific amount of cash to pay off a friend and then he wanted the rest in payments. And so I said, great, we can do that. We could pay it off in 12, 12 months. We did it interest-free and it worked out really, really good. So first you negotiate the price and you get it down as low as possible and as low as you're comfortable with, making sure that you're giving everybody a win-win. If it's not a win-win, then walk away from it. But after that, we wanna figure out what the terms are. You can be really creative with terms. So monthly payments are great. You can do no payments in a balloon where you pay off the balance at a later date. You can just, as creative as possible, you can do. And it really just depends on what their needs are and what your needs are. There's a lot of benefits to doing monthly payments. First off, it gives people additional cash flow, especially if they're older and they're on a fixed income, which a lot of people are right now uh, that own land they're gonna be interested in that because prices of everything is going up. So if they can increase their monthly income, it's gonna be very, very beneficial for them. It's also gonna create less of a taxable event. If they sell a piece of land that's not their primary residence, it's gonna be long-term capital gains, generally speaking. And so that's a higher taxable event versus if they spread that out over time. So that's just an additional benefit to think about and to spell out for them. Once you have the terms figured out though, and again, get as creative as possible, negotiate, really find out what their needs are, ask them if they'd be open to it. And then what you're gonna wanna do is basically create a contract that spells this out. If you need help with this, title companies and escrow companies are great at helping. And um, you'll probably want to go through an escrow company so that everything is handled properly. I would also suggest that if you have any contracts created, you have a real estate attorney review those just to make sure that you're not going to be in trouble with any kind of legal things. But generally speaking, you can get a contract written up in a couple hours uh, and it's well worth the time for an attorney to do that for you. So my biggest suggestions for you is that number one, make sure to get as much information as possible. Be personal. Be sure that you're getting all the information, understand what their motivation is, and think about the offer that you can create that's going to benefit them as well as benefit you. The second thing is ask for the price that they'd be open to selling at. Don't give them a price off the bat, you know? And really quick here, one of the secret things that I like to say is if somebody says, and you get into a stalemate, this happens all the time because it's a pretty typical rule of negotiation where somebody will say, well, what, will, what would you be offering me? I'd I'd be open to selling. What do you want to buy it for? You know, if you go back and say, well, well, what are you interested in selling for? Is there a price that you have in mind? That's a good, quick, easy way to, to see if they have anything. And then you have to just be quiet, right? Let them talk and let that uncomfortable, <laughs> awkward silence happen. Because at some point, somebody's going to talk. And generally speaking, you know, people don't like to have awkward silences. So if you say, well, what price would you be open to? And you just be quiet and wait to see who's going to win that. And if they say, well, you contacted me, tell me what price you want. The thing that I like to say too, as a kind of final ditch effort to not, you know, make them feel like they're going to get a bad offer is I say, well, I don't want to lowball you or I, I don't want to, you know, give you something that might offend you. So that's just really why I want to know kind of what your ballpark is. Do you have a range in mind and really work for some kind of price back? And that's really, really helpful. If they give you a range too, 
that's a great thing to ask because if you said, you know, I'd be open to selling, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60,000. In my mind, when they give me that 40,000 price, that's the bottom of the range, that's where we're starting at now. So asking for ranges is a really, really good tip also in terms of negotiating for price. Once you have the price done though, then you negotiate the terms. Okay, this is the price that we'll do. How about payments? We'll be open to payments. Would you like additional cash flow? Um, you know, what is the benefit really that you're after in selling the property? You have to remember, real estate is an illiquid invest investment, right? People don't generally buy it so that they can flip it and cash out really, really quickly. A lot of times the land that's been owned has been owned for a long time, so you have to get into the mindset of the people that are selling. Make sure that you're creating a win-win situation. Make sure that you're not taking advantage of anybody and that you're not being taken advantage of as well. If you have any other questions, comment down below. I'd be happy to uh, answer them. I'm definitely gonna do more videos on how to find good deals. Be sure to subscribe and like this video too so that you can follow along as our family builds our house. Hope you have a great day and we'll talk soon.